Thank you, Florence, and thank you, everybody, so much for inviting me to speak at this uh, exciting conference. So, um, here's me, um, quite a lot of years ago, uh, playing in the park that was over the road from my house. Uh, there was a busy road between my house and the park, and my mother used to see me just to the edge of the road to make sure I could get to the park, and then I would run. The playground, as you may see, has a hard surface, and I just noticed yesterday when I sent the photo that I have a plaster on my elbow because clearly I was always falling down. So I've been thinking, how has the world changed since I was a child, since many of us here were children, uh, and um, about the lives of the children and young people uh, living now? And what kind of playgrounds do they have? What kind of places do they go? What kind of roads do they have to cross? And what kind of responsibilities do their parents have in seeing them across that road and then in letting them be free to play? As I go and speak in different cities and work in different cities, I've noticed the trend, and I don't know if the evidence supports me on this, though I will talk about evidence soon. I've noticed how often the playgrounds are empty. We're building nicer playgrounds now. The surfaces are softer, the equipment is more colorful, and there are um, special crossings on the roads, perhaps, but often these playgrounds are empty. And I wonder what fears parents have that they don't want their children to go out, what fears they have about the public spaces and the opportunities that their children could have and perhaps should have. So I spend a lot of time, a lot of my research, with children and young people as they go online, because that's what they're doing in increasing numbers, in increasing amounts of time, using ever more personalized devices that it's very hard for parents and teachers and others to see. And they're using them for everything. Consultations with children now say children have, as it were, added a right to the CRC. I'm sorry if that's blasphemous. Uh, they consider going online to be their right. Why do they consider that? Because the going online is their means to exercising all of their rights in a digital age. It was 30 years ago when the Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted, and it was 30 years ago when the World Wide Web was invented. I think at that time, we thought these were going to be events which could support each other. And the early expectations of the internet was that this would be exactly that world in which children could be free to learn and explore and express themselves and discover new possibilities and meet with others. And in the last 30 years, it has increasingly come to feel as if the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the World Wide Web are on a kind of collision course, and that the internet and all the digital world that it brings with it is somehow beginning to undermine and violate and infringe children's rights in the, uh, of, of all different kinds. And it's true, there are many ways in which the internet is posing new kinds of challenges. We have to wonder, and I think many adults do, what are those children looking at on that screen? And the question that I would like you to ask and to consider is what do you want them to be looking at on that screen, given that they are not going to let go? I don't know if you've tried to take a phone off a child. Actually, it's quite hard to take a phone off me as well. What do we want, and who's going to put it there, and how are we going to support those children so that that fun social activity that they're clearly having <laughs> behind me <laughs> is really a benefit to them and a means of supporting their rights? So I read the Mayor's declaration for this conference with great interest. And I read it as I do any document that I now read, especially anything to do with children's rights. I read it through the lens of the digital. Because the online and the offline are increasingly intersecting. 
There is no neat dividing line. I don't say that they're the same. We don't quite live in virtual reality yet. But it is very hard to make the line. What happens online affects what happens offline. What happens offline affects what happens online. The two are part of most, increasingly most experiences in children's lives. I should say at this point that in many countries in the world, children still struggle to gain access to the internet, to the digital at all. And in children's consultations, what they most often and first want to talk about is access. And they want to talk about access to good connectivity, to the devices which are going to be useful and efficient for them. And they talk about this, of course, in low-income countries, where it's a big issue. They talk about it also in middle-income countries, where it's also a big issue, and in high-income countries. And I think it's interesting that access remains a concern. It remains a concern for children because not everyone allows them to do what they would want to do on the internet, because there's a lot of barriers that they find to getting access. And this is something, I think, that municipalities, that mayors can do something about. Then, let me just read your declaration, the declaration, which I hope Everyone knows. Children should be valued in their community, it says. So I read that children should be valued also in their online community. Do we know if children feel valued in their online community in the cities that you come from? How would you find that out? Children should have a voice about public laws, policies, budgets, decisions affecting them. I will add online. Online, do they have that voice? Do they have that voice in your municipality? What would be the mechanisms to ensure that the budgets, that the resources, that the training that the adults receive about the digital, about the digital world, that children have a voice in all of that in your municipality? Children should have access to quality and essential services for education, health, safety, and so forth. Do they have that online? Whose responsibility is it to ensure that they have that online? I think it, very often, it's the local, it's the city, it's the municipality. Do they have opportunities for family, pleasure, <laughs> play and leisure? So, the whole document I read through this lens, and what I want to urge is that there are many ways in which cities can play a role in ensuring that the digital environment is a supportive and uh, fulfilling and exciting for children and young people as we hope that the uh, physical environment could be. So, uh, Florence mentioned the Global Kids Online project, which I coordinate with UNICEF, and we're working in countries around the world to try to understand what are children's experiences, what are their concerns, uh, what is the reality of the online world for them. And we offered this idea of a ladder, which I think is well known in, in, in child rights world, not to say that there is a single point that everyone must reach, but to provoke the question, what do we want children to attain in the digital world? What we found in our research is that most children, when they get access, go to the first rung of the ladder. They search, they watch videos, they play games, they listen to music, they send messages. When they get a little more experience, they begin networking, they start commenting, they use it for their schoolwork. Not so many children get much further. Not so many look for the news, pursue their hobbies, create their own content. Few use the internet for health, to discover about health information, for campaigns, to create their own narratives and blogs. Where do we want them to go? Every rung of that ladder in our research is marked by inequalities. You can guess which children get further and which children are held back. One reason they're held back is that I think we as adults are worried. We don't like what's on that bottom rung. We worry about children playing games. 
We worry who they're sending messages to. We think it's pointless that they're watching all these videos on YouTube. We don't necessarily support that first rung, but that first rung is where they gain the skills and where they get the enthusiasm and where they explore what they feel is their world, and that gives them the ability to do further activities, which often we might hope for. On the downside, more access does bring more opportunities, but it also brings more risks. And I want to make one point about risks, because we have so much research about all the risks for children online. The cyberbullying, the pornography, the grooming, the hate. There are lots of problems, and there's lots to be addressed. But the point I'd like to make, and I'll show in a, in a slightly complicated graph, if you'll forgive me, is that risk does not necessarily result in harm. And the reason it doesn't is because of what the states and the municipalities and the families can do to protect and support and empower children. So this is one graph from our Global Kids Online research, and it shows along the bottom how many risks children report encountering in a particular country. And it shows on the vertical how many of them say, and I was upset by something online. Something was a problem for me online. And the countries that we've researched so far, you can see, are scattered. And they're scattered in the way that in some countries, like in Montenegro and Albania, children are encountering rather few risks and reporting not so much harm. And in some countries, like in South Africa and Chile, they're reporting more risks and more harm. But in some countries, and these are the ones I draw your attention to, like in Bulgaria and Italy, they're reporting more risks, but not more harm. And that's where I ask myself, OK, so what is happening in some countries that children can be free to explore, and they can encounter some risk, but it doesn't mean that something online worries and upsets them. And that's the question of um, parental support, education, budgets to support their online experiences, provision of remedies, coordination of uh, resources and support. So back to an image of the park, I think we all know that agency and resilience require what we might call risky opportunities. I think online, we are really struggling to enable children to develop that agency and resilience that facilitates the risky opportunities. And that's where learning comes from, but somehow we have to enable a certain amount of risk online. And just to end with a word about that online, that digital environment. Perhaps this is what a child-friendly online city looks like. I don't know. I, I, th I think a lot about this environment. Is this a child-friendly city online or a child-unfriendly city online? Do we, are we happy that the library is taken over by Google, that um, the, uh, um, the bookshop is replaced by Amazon, that the shopping mall is replaced by eBay, and so on. Is this a fair depiction? So I think what municipalities, what states, what child rights organizations are facing when they think about the online environment is a world that does seem to be taking over what we know. It does seem to be transforming what we're familiar with, it seems heavily commercial. All of those public organizations that we are used to supporting, the library, the school, the streets, the parks, these have all now become corporate places. How are we going to think differently about children's rights in corporate spaces, in business spaces? These are transnational organizations. This is not your local school district, your local library organization, the streets that you have 
um, responsibility for. This is, these are transnational organizations. It is hard for cities to address these organizations, but there are ways in which they can connect, ways in which they can work together. Actually, everything that UNICEF is doing in relation to the digital world is precisely about finding that power through connection and through collaboration. And these are very interdependent spaces. I think we're just beginning to think, how does Google share data with Amazon? What happens when you go on YouTube and the child's data is tracked and given to eBay for the advertising? Does the municipal municipality, the state, have responsibility here? Can we think more, think harder, about how our public institutions, schools, libraries, family resources, health services, are sharing data with some of these organizations, and can we strengthen our data protection and our privacy protection in children's best interests? So, I think perhaps my last word, and I'll stop, is try not to fall for the hype. Forgive me if that seems misleading. There's a lot of hyperbole about, there's a lot of myths about but society, even though the technology seems to be changing fast, society is changing more slowly, and all kinds of dimensions of society are looking for guidance. And what I hear in my research is that parents, schools, children are looking for guidance locally. They want a place to go locally that advises them about their privacy online that advises them about great resources online, that provides health information online that perhaps children can't get from other places. There is time to provide that, and I think the time really is now. Technology always seems like a solution. A lot of organizations are reaching for technology as a solution. But technology is a solution, and it also brings new problems. It's not going to be the cheap, quick, scalable answer to everything that one might hope. Artificial intelligence, much is being said. What the experts are telling me is artificial intelligence is still pretty stupid. Let's be careful. It's very far from fulfilling the child's right to non-discrimination. And data is leaking all over the place. I hope all the municipalities represented here are being very careful with children's data, because children's data is children's privacy. And children's privacy is a requirement for them to express themselves and explore and become agents and citizens in a digital world. It may not be obvious from my um, uh, talk, though I've tried in the images and in the research to communicate. All of this work is being done by myself and many others in consultation with children, with input from children. And it's not yet clear, but I hope it will be soon clear, that municipalities, that mayors, that cities are also consulting children about their rights specifically in the digital environment. Thank you.